Welcome back to another lecture of Psychology 101. I'm your instructor, Dr. Shadi Bashai, and in today's lecture, we will be talking about human development, and we'll be discussing the second part of uh, the topic of human development, which corresponds to Chapter 10 of your textbook. So, last time we talked about Piaget's very influential theory of cognitive development. Piaget's theory did not stand alone. There were other competing theories that tried to explain human uh, development and in particular cognitive and social development, one of which is called the ecological uh, systems theory uh, developed by Bronfenbrenner. And the ecological systems theory by Bronfenbrenner argues that no child develops cognitively or socially in a vacuum, meaning that there are multiple factors and, and multiple influences that shape or influence the trajectory on which children uh, um, are on. And it almost looks like concentric circles of, of influence, and it's a very dynamic system. And I'll show you what that might look like. So it looks like something like this. And then you find here's the child in the innermost circle. And just outside of that, there is the microsystem. And the microsystem corresponds to factors that directly influence the child, including their parents, uh, daycare, schooling that they go to. And the child and the microsystem are all also interacting dynamically with the system above it, this system, which is the mesosystem, which is the neighborhood level. And that is all occurring within the exosystem, which is the community service, parent workplace, and, uh, and, it's, and, uh, and such. And then finally, the microsystem, which is, incorporates concepts such as norms, such as laws. Uh, these are things that we call culture um, overall. And this is basically what uh, Bronfenbrenner imagined a child's development looks like. It's these concentric circles of influence in a very dynamic system. And then there was Vygotsky's sociocultural theory. And Vygotsky's uh, sociocultural theory um, pinned upon two principles. The first principle is, is inner dialogue, about how important inner, inner dialogue is, uh, or private speech um, in early human development, especially when children are trying to structure or understand the world in which they find themselves in. Or perhaps maybe using inner speech to guide behavior, which uh, corresponds to also a change in the prefrontal cortex. It makes you more capable of controlling or inhibiting wrong behaviors. So Vyskoski really stressed this dialogue between the child themselves and their inner dialogue and the, the, uh, the di direct environmental influences, including their guardian um, or p their parent. And what Vizkotsky really stressed is that the child can attain a next mile of, uh, milestone of achievement cognitively if there is an adult around that can just push them just beyond their limits or beyond their reach uh, or create environments through which uh, the child can be nourished so that they can uh, step into the next milestone, if you will. Okay? And Vyskotsky talked about this, the discrepancy between uh, where the child is right now and where the child can be with the, with the guidance or the, sh the scaffold, the, the, shaping, um, the shaping of an adult or a close guardian. And when an adult or a close guardian shapes the environment so that the child it, it's optimized for the child's learning needs that's what's called scaffolding okay so that the 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 adult is creating this curated environment uh, in which the child 
can be nourished and can step to the next milestone, if you will. And as I was mentioning earlier, the zone of proximal uh, development is this discrepancy between where the child is right now and where they can get to uh, with, uh, w with appropriate uh, guidance. So we talked about motor development, we talked about prenatal development, we talked about cognitive development, and we haven't touched upon something that's really quite central to humanity, uh, which is emotional development. And uh, perhaps there's nothing more central in the concept of emotional development than this concept of attachment. And attachment is this strong bond that one person has towards another special person uh, in their life. Um, and that strong bond that people and the quality of those bonds that people have as adults are actually very much influenced by the very first attachment or the quality of the very first attachment that they had to a parental figure, turns out. Okay, So attachment is the, is the strong emotional bond. Bonding is the process to get to that attachment point. Okay, So bonding is this it, the process of emotional attachment that may occur, for example, between a, a, an offspring, a child, and their parent. And usually this bonding process happens in a very critical period, uh, really early on in a child's uh, or the offspring's life, minutes or hours immediately after birth. Um, and a, a, a very uh, kind of a visceral example of what that is, is the example of imprinting. And this is uh, the example of when ducklings imprint onto their mothers because the mother or the shape of the mother is the very first thing that they see in very uh, early minutes of life and then they become imprinted onto that image so that they follow that image around and of course that evolved um, to solve a particular problem in uh, in the child's life which is survival really early on in, in life okay so this is uh, an image here of uh, ducklings imprinting onto the mother and just following uh, the, the mother around. And this is an image of uh, the power of imprinting, if you will. This is a famous researcher by the name of uh, Conrad Lorenz. And he showed that if he replaced, he himself replaced uh, the mother duck, uh, little ducklings can actually imprint onto him if, if he is present in the critical, uh, critical minutes of early bonding. Perhaps nothing's more illustrative of the need for emotional bonding than uh, the results of the rhesus monkey studies conducted by uh, Harry Harlow and others. And what the rhesus monkeys experiment showed <clears throat> was that if you provide a rhesus monkey raised in isolation so if you if you provide them with a choice between a bare wire mother uh, that provided nourishment in the form of food and a terry cloth soft to the touch mother that provided uh, perhaps you know a, a a contact comfort the rhesus monkeys raised in isolation will spend the majority of their time attached to the soft to the touch terry cloth mother okay? even though the nourishment was actually associated or provided by the other cool to the touch bare wire mother and the results the shocking results i guess at the time of the harry harlow uh, study really flew in the face of what behaviorists really thought was at play. Uh, the, the reason why children form an attachment with a mother figure is what behaviorists would have you believe is because they would say the mother provides some kind of a reward for that behavior in the form of uh, food, nourishment, whatever it is. But what the Harry Harlow studies really showed was that Reassuring physical contact is actually incredibly important in making an emotional bond or emotional connection 
happen between uh, mother and child. And really, this work with monkeys spawned an era in, uh, in people and psychologists trying to understand emotional development. And perhaps one of the most influential figures is John Bowlby, who uh, was one of the very first people to apply the concept of attachment uh, to humanity, to humans. And he argued that it, the emotional tie between the baby and the, uh, the offspring and the mother or the guardian is incredibly central to survival. So these were his theoretical ideas, his concepts, and then he had a graduate student, and her name was uh, Mary Ainsworth. And Mary Ainsworth came up with an ingenious way to actually uh, quantify this process and actually classify the quality of the relationship, the relationship bond offspring has with, uh, with the parent or the guardian. And the, the, the technique that she's devised is called the strange situation technique. And I have a, an embedded video here that I'm going to challenge you to stop the current video and uh, go watch the YouTube clip here, to, again, to illustrate uh, what is really meant by the strange, uh, uh, the strange situation um, paradigm. And the strange situation paradigm really takes advantage of the separation anxiety that develops in infants uh, right around seven or eight months. And it capitalizes on this separation anxiety and gives a classification as to uh, the reactions of the child when separated from mother. Uh, and the, re the re gives, a, gives a name or a, or a quality to the reactions the child has when they're reunited with the mother and also when there's a stranger present. There are a number of different uh, moderations that they have on these experiments. So I do challenge you to, to stop the video and watch the YouTube clip. But what these experiments showed us was that you can actually classify uh, the bonds that children have with offspring or parent into three or four reliable bins. And the first bin here is called the secure attachment uh, type of attachment or, or emotional bond. And this is shown in a strange situation when, when the child is distressed, when the mother leaves the room, but then the child is almost immediately soothed by the return of the mother. And in fact, uh, greets her with, with almost joy. And about 60% of all children that Mary uh, Ainsworth tested in this paradigm showed this type of secure attachment. And it turns out that secure attachment is, is, a, is a protective resilience factor, uh, even later on in life as adults. So there's this bin, the, the, the one quality is called the secure attachment, which is captures 60%. And then there is the another uh, quality to attachment that she found through her through her testing, which is called insecure avoidant type of attachment, and this is when the child is almost indifferent when the mother leaves, and again indifferent when she returns. So it's a bit of an av an avoidant, almost a an ambivalent type of an attachment, and that captures fifteen to twenty percent of the infants. Uh, or the quality of the uh, infant-mother relationships that Mary Ainsworth saw in her laboratory. And then there's another category, and this category is called anxious, ambivalent, or insecure, uh, anxious form of attachment. And uh, this is when the child shows distress, even when the mother is there. So the child is, even at baseline, is quite distressed. And the child reacts with panic when the mother leaves and is almost conflicted when the mother is returned, right? So the, the, the is almost showing hostility to the mother when the mother returns. So sometimes it's called anxious ambivalent 
type or form of attachment. And that, again, explains about 15% of uh, the, the types of attachments that Mary Ainsworth saw in her research. And then if you're doing the math here, you find that 5 to 10% of the, the relationships or the attachment types that Mary Ainsworth saw didn't fit in any one category, and they fit in actually multiple categories. And that is called the disorganized uh, attachment type um, or the disorganized category of attachment. So, so this research came out in the 50s and 60s, Harry Harlow's research. And Mary Ainsworth's research came out in, again, 60s, 70s, probably. And around the same time, women were, were marching in drones and uh, occupying a huge part of the workforce. And for that reason, child care became a, a very important part of North American society. So people began really worrying about the quality of the uh, attachments that mothers and children are, are forming when the child is, is, in, uh, is in child care. And it turns out, and this is a, in accordance with a lot of research that we've done, especially longitudinal research on the topic, daycare and daycare occupations and daycare use utilization does not at all have a negative impact, at least this is from the studies that I'm aware of, and according to your textbook, they do not have a significant negative impact on the quality of uh, the attachment that the child forms with, with the mother. So this is really the crux of what the research or the current research is telling us about that. So we talked about attachment, which is this quality of the emotional bond or the emotional tie between uh, an offspring and mother or uh, between a person and another person. And now there's temperament. And temperament is this long-lasting individual difference in disposition or almost personality, but it's like you can't get personality. You can't say a little infant has personality, of course, right? Because they can't even speak. They can't represent the world through symbolic language. So the, it's basically temperament is the quality or the intensity of their emotional reactions, if you will. And much like the work that Ainsworth has done with temperament, Thomas and Chess have conducted a very similar study. Uh, it's called the New York Longitudinal Study. And through that study, they can actually also classify several, uh, several categories of temperaments that they, that they found exist among infants that they examined. And these temperamental styles are, first is the easy child. And this is the child that, is, that mostly displays uh, positive emotions and uh, does not react to strangers or strange situations with uh with you know they don't they don't get perturbed by negative emotions as much in these situations there's the slow to warm up child which so the easy child by the way is the temperament style of about 40 percent of the children that uh, thomas and chess thought, saw in their uh, experiment and then 15 percent were the slow to warm up children in terms of their temperament and what those children uh, look like is they reacted to strange situations and to strangers, if you will, and or just unfamiliar environments with a, a lot of anxiety initially, but that anxiety quickly dissipates and goes away. So that's about 15% of all children seen in that study. And then another 10% were, uh, were categorized as this difficult temperamental children who had mostly just negative uh, in anxious reactions to strange situations uh, or novel environments. And much like the research on attachment, which, you know, there are a proportion of children that didn't fall in one or the other attachment style, there was a proportion of children, and this time it's a significant one, it's 35%, that their temperament couldn't really be categorized in one uh, of the three uh, aforementioned temperamental styles. 
And then Keegan took this idea of temperament from Thomas and Chess, and he talked about something that turns out to be very important in our understanding of anxiety uh, in adulthood much later on, is this concept of behavioral inhibition, which is, again, it's the tendency uh, to be frightened at very no, you know, novel or uh, unexpected stimuli. Okay? And it turns out that the behavioral inhibition is a, is a type of temperament uh, typified by some children that actually puts them at a greater risk for social anxiety disorder. So when, when a child is behaviorally inhibited, which are showing extreme anxious reactions to novel situations, uh, they more uh, likely um, than children not showing this particular temperament early in life uh, go on to develop things like social anxiety disorder, etc. Having said that, people on the very low end, so infants on the very low end of this of this behavioral inhibition trait often show risk for impulse related issues okay so now they're not actually inhibited at all you know none of their uh, reactions are inhibited so i guess the goal, there's a goldilocks zone here of behavioral inhibition that you probably want to have so we talked about cognitive reasoning and development we talked about uh you know, motor development, prenatal development, and now we discuss, and of course, emotional development, but now we discuss moral reasoning and moral development. And moral development is concerned, or the field of moral development is concerned with how people or children develop a moral compass, a system of attitudes that guide people between what is right and what is wrong. And and this compass could be picked up from a number of places, including, you know, from tradition, uh, from culture, from institutions, from be from you know parents or peers, etc. And believe it or not, Piaget, the guy we talked about, who had the, uh, the his theory of cognitive development, he also had a theory uh, that is much more simplified, if you will, for moral development. Okay? And Piaget said that children very early on, especially in pre-operational stage, for example, and the, the concrete operational stage of, um, of cognitive development, they show very rigid, more, kind of rule-bound morality that is almost always based on some kind of an external force such as you know, a compass that is gleaned from the parents um, and or based on some kind of a, an avoidance of punishment or uh, the maximizing of pleasure, right? So the, the, he called this particular uh, stage of moral development the heteronormous morality, okay? It's, it's incumbent upon some kind of an external force, external compass, and then he said later on in a formal operational stage of cognitive development, children start to develop or go into or ease into this other stage of moral development called the autonomous morality, which is a more self-directed compass of morality, which is, this is when the child begins to think abstractly about what is right and what is wrong. I want you to take a minute here to ponder the following. And when you've read through the scenario, I want you to think about the following question, which is, should the husband have done what he's done? And your answer to this question, based on this particular scenario, is dependent, according to Kohlberg, uh, to which level of morality you're at. And Kohlberg uh, Kohlberg is, is a researcher who, much like Piaget, developed his own theory of moral development, and he added a stage onto uh, Piaget's binary system, if you will. And he said there is pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional morality, and let's go in turn and discuss what each of these means. So there's the pre-conventional morality, which is basically a moral compass that's guided by a focus on rewards 
and punishments, so the avoidance of punishments and uh, the maximizing of rewards, if you will. So this is basically what the it happens early in life and then governs uh, moral decisions fairly early in life. And then the child progresses through the second stage of uh, Kohlberg's morality theory, which is the conventional morality stage. And this is uh, a stage in morality that is governed, if you will, by societal rules and societal norms that the child internalizes. And then uh, based on that, based on fear of social ostracism or disapproval, people make their, their moral decisions, if you will. And then in the final stage, the person moves beyond rule-based judgments and starts making their own um, uh, their own judgments of what is right and what is wrong, governed by an internal moral compass or uh, m- moral principles, if you will. Um, and this is really highly tied to uh, the child, and I get at this point the adolescent or the young adult's ability to think in abstract terms. Okay, so now you know, abstraction comes in. You can move away from the structure and the rigidity of pre-conventional and conventional moralities. There have been criticisms, of course, of, uh, of Kohlberg's ideas. And these criticisms come in the form of cultural criticisms that, that his, uh, his understanding or his conceptualization of morality in these three stages really depends on an individualistic uh, cultural basis and in, in an individualistic culture and this typifies most of Western cultures, the the individual's needs and goals are really what is primed and what is valued, whereas in collectivist cultures, uh, which value more the needs of the collective, and often the needs of the collective will thwart or trump the needs of the individual in these cultures. Okay, So some people uh, criticize Kohlberg's idea uh, as that they fit more with an individualistic as opposed to a collectivist nation, uh, notion. And then there are the gender biases that appear in, in uh, orientations of, or understanding of justice, conceptualization of things like Karen, right? And Carol Gilligan was one of the major critics of Kohlberg. Uh, and she said that all of his research subjects were actually boys. And so his research really applies only to boys and to men and and not really to to girls and women. Uh, And then there's the criticism that really moral attitudes is weakly linked, weakly correlated with moral behavior. So whether or not somebody is in in stage one or stage three of moral development, in accordance to Kohlberg, it may or may not govern much of their actual behavior. And then finally, the idea that moral reasoning comes before emotional reactions is also another criticism here uh, that is embodied in the Kohlberg theory of moral development. Okay? So again, no theory in psychology or anywhere else actually is devoid of criticisms. Okay, So we have to really weigh the pros and the cons of each of these. So we talked about early development. Now let's talk about adolescence and the bridge from adolescence to adulthood. So adolescence is is a period extending anywhere from 12 to about 25. And puberty is a particular time zone in that period of adolescence of 12 to 25 where the, the reproductive system really matures and really grows. And the period that is known as adolescence is oftentimes referred to in, in the literature as the storm and stress period of life. And this is because, yes, there is a lot of stress that happens during these periods because the adolescent is now negotiating new roles and trying to find who they are as individuals during that time. And, and during that time, of course, there are a lot of role confusion, a lot of... Um, undifferentiated boundaries and it's it's normal to experience things like like stress for example so not just that most adolescents experience 
a, a really a surge of healthy social and emotional development during adolescence. So the, these are um, these are very very important milestones during adolescence, and given the fact that their adolescents are trying to differentiate who they are as people, there's lots of conflicts with peers and with parents, okay, because they're becoming their own adults, if you will. So that's fairly typical in the trajectory. However, what is atypical are influences of pernicious factors such as poverty and parental alcoholism or substance use, etc. Okay, so these are actually atypical factors that may uh, change the trajectory of a growing adolescent. So let's talk more about physical development during adolescence. So as we talked about, puberty is this period when the reproductive system matures. And it happens at different times for females and males. So for females, they enter puberty anywhere from 8 to 13. And for males, it happens about typically two years later, anywhere from 10 to 14. And oftentimes puberty, this period of reproductive growth, is preceded by what is called growth spurts. And during growth spurts, there are growth hormones that trigger the development of what we call secondary sexual characteristics, which are physical features that differentiate the sexes, but they're not necessarily tied to reproduction in and of itself. Okay, And an example of that would be uh, breasts, for example, or uh, pubic hair. So these things are not really tied to reproduction per se, yet they're associated with uh, differentiation sexes. So early matures, according to a little bit of research, face a little bit of a disadvantage. And remember, time in adolescence is a time when kids are trying to fit in uh, with their group or, or with their peers. So anything that differentiates them, and in this particular case, it's maturing a little bit too early, can be viewed as, as a disadvantage. Uh, however, the research is actually telling us that there are very few long-term consequences. Uh, there is an, two important concepts for us to discuss, which is the uh, the minarch, and the minarch is the onset of menstruation for uh, for females, and oftentimes that typically uh, signifies the end of physical maturity, uh, such as changes in height, for example. And then another concept, which is the sperm mark, which is the first ejaculation typically happening around the 13 years of age for boys. Uh, and it's not necessarily uh, tied to end of physical maturation, not like the minarch is. So let's talk about cognitive development during the adolescence period. So most adolescents would be occupying what Piaget called the formal operational stage. And this is when adolescents can really represent the world symbolically through language and through other, uh, other skills and, and imagery, mental imagery that they've developed over time. Okay, so this is the one they can actually project into the future. And oftentimes there are two cognitive distortions that are associated uh, with this particular period of cognitive development, adolescence that is. The first is imaginary audience. It's, just, it's the belief that you're always on stage as an adolescent belief that all eyes on you is that they're you're you know you're on the sp you're in the spotlight if you will and then the second uh, cognitive fallacy during that period as well uh, is what is called the personal fable fallacy which is this belief that y your experiences are so unique as to uh, render anyone's understanding of them impossible that is you believe that your story is so unique to you that no one will ever understand what you're actually going through. 